But do we need to say, I don't think we've done our little, we haven't done it in a while to oh, do wait. our we, urine. Oh my goodness. <laughs> say the name, who we are and say yeah, the that, name of our podcast. Anyway, we're going to get, we're going to get it one of these it's years. It's been a while. One of these years, we're going to get it right. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Hi everyone. I'm Alison Gwynn. I'm Amelia Cormack. And you're in Some Dark Holler. I'd rather be in some dark other where the sun refused to shine than for you to be another man's woman never on Hi everyone, welcome to Some Dark Holler. We're a murder ballad podcast. Oh, I like where that. we combine folk music um, and true crime into one podcast for your listening pleasure. Yes, well, one big happy family. Yay! Yes. Oh my goodness! Da, 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 da. Everyone, attention! Amelia has done it. <laughs> she has brought forth. The savior and the fruit of my loins, the child, the golden child, the child that will save us all. (laughs) No pressure. I mean, no, not at all. Um, No pressure on this child. No, this is our, this is our first time, um, recording post bebe. How do you feel? Um, I feel good, but also crazy. Like mum brain, (laughs) mum brain is a real thing. I mean, you yeah. feel like, I feel like my brain is Swiss cheese. And I, I was thinking in, in us preparing for uh, for recording, I was like, am I going to say words right or be funny <laughs> at all or be able to Don't track you worry. the story? <laughs> Don't you worry. We'll just, I'll put it all together in editing. I know, because my friend is brilliant. No, but I am, I am persistent. I <laughs> I will say we we should say um, our sound today is brought to you by uh, my wonderful husband Roger, who is very kindly. Roger got sick of uh, <laughs> my uh, not yours, my mine too. Rustic <laughs> at home studio and my inability to get the level right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, and here we go. Here in the background, you will notice the uh, the local firehouse siren. That's going to be so. In Astoria, we had motorbikes. So here you'll yeah. have firehouse sirens, and a potential cat meowing, and maybe a baby crying. So it's going to be. I all love things. all of this. It's real life. It is real life. You're tranche right. de vie, as Ooh. they say in the theater. I have slice heard, of life. I haven't heard that one, and I speak French. That's amazing. <laughs> I adore that. I mean, you have worked in the theaters all over the world and and well, the country. Yeah, but. I have never worked at Dollywood. Oh. My mom wants me to. I mean, she that's wants a me, dream. She wants me to be the story lady. Uh, the uh, story yeah. lady is, uh, I, I guess she's kind of like a mix between like Mother Goose and just like a crazy old country lady that walks around. <laughs> How do you feel about that? I How mean, do you give feel me about time? Some theme park work. Um, I mean, I do love Dollywood. I, but, do you know what? I didn't get the chance to go when we were in Knoxville. I was so upset. I think I had rehearsal that day because uh, I was an understudy. If you have a chance, go. Yeah, I really want to. And they have, weirdly, they have like an Alcatraz Museum in Pigeon Forge, oh. Tennessee. And like these random like artifacts like Ted Bundy's car is there. <laughs> That's horrifying. Random stuff. Just random stuff. stuff. The Titanic Museum is there, weirdly. Hmm. Yeah. There we go. I mean, I just want to go and ride some Dolly-themed roller coasters, basically. Yeah. And uh, it used to be Silver Dollar City. Uh. And it was based on mining. And there were some really janky, like, rides (laughs) called... One was called The Flooded Mine... Oh, God. And you go through this, like, a log flume type thing, and it's about an escaped convict. And uh, the convict's set loose in the mines, and he blows up the mine and 
you're trying to escape and you get through and there's like audio animatronic canaries that are hanging by their feet like <gasps> there's a gas leak or something. It's it's just very uh, traumatic. <laughs> yes. That sounds horrifying, but um, also fun. And know. there was like a theme song that was like, and you might get out but you might might not lyrical geniuses they were 100%. but you might might not you might might not <laughs> you just might not yeah add, add, maybe they, let's yeah. vary it up a little bit yeah maybe i have our very first plug which um i'm very excited to um talk about my lovely lovely friends jason chatfield and scott dooley two australian comedians um but also cartoonist jason is a cartoonist for the new yorker and they have a fantastic podcast called is there something in this where they come up with ideas for <laughs> new yorker cartoons it's really fun but they have written a book called you're not a real parent until um and it's so fun i have a copy um and it's really fun just really amazing cartoons but they've given us a little um discount for our listeners Yay. um they'll give us 15 percent off if you use the code dark holler so all one word d-a-r-k-h-o-l-l-e-r go to you're not a real dot com um and that's um y-o-u-r-e n-o-t-a-r-e-a-l dot com um, and you can get uh, 15% off using that code, which is so, so, so lovely. Yeah, thanks, um, guys. Them. We also have a link, um, which is a direct link, so we can um, put that in our bio. Yeah. Um, but give them a support. They're fantastic, and the podcast is super, super fun, okay. um, and they're brilliant. Um, so, yeah, go Thank check them you out. guys. Yeah. Can't wait. Yeah. Um, but – it is indeed my turn to uh, tell my dear friend Allison a story. Is it in North Carolina? It is not. <gasps> it is not. Um, so my story today is um, based on uh, a song called Delia. The song is known as Delia or Delia's Gone. Um, and it's a really famous, we're heading towards a more bluesy end yeah. of the folk spectrum, but it's been recorded by a lot of country artists and folk artists. a gambler, gambled all around. She was a gambling girl and she laid her money down. She's all I got is gone. Delia's dear mother took a trip out west. When she returned, little Delia had gone to rest. She's all I got is gone. Delia's mother weep, Delia's father mourn. Hate so bad if that child had died at home. She's all I got is gone. Delia, oh Delia, how can it be? Say you love them rounders and don't love me. She's all I got is gone. Courtesy's in the barroom, bringing out the silver cup. Delia, she's in the graveyard. Made Wake up, she's all I got is gone. Rubber tied buggy, double seated hack. Take and deal you to the cemetery, but fail to bring her back. She's all I got is gone. Delia, oh Delia, poor girl, she's gone. All I hate, she has left me all alone. She's all I got is gone. Judge says to Curtis, What's that fuss about? On account of those gamblers are trying to drive me out. She's all I got is gone. Curtis says to Judge, Judge, what may be my fine? I just told you, poor boy, you got 99. She's all I got is gone. Up on the housetop, high than I could see. Looking at those rounders, looking out for me. She's all I got is gone. Curtis looking high, Curtis looking low. Shot poor Delia down with that hating 44. She's all I got is gone. She's all I got is gone. She's all I got is gone. 
Um, so I'm going to tell you the story of what really happened to lovely Delia. Uh, but before I start, um, I wanted to list my main sources for this story are Delia by John Gast, which is a little book, a blog post called Sing Out Delia slash Delia's Gone, a digital compendium 1900 to 1992 by Patrick Blackman, good old Wikipedia, uh, The Sad Song of Delia Green and Cooney Houston by Sean Willents, and Murder by Gaslight, Delia's Gone, One More Round. Um, there wasn't an author on that one, but if you search for the title, you can find it pretty easily. So our story takes place in Yamacraw, Savannah, Georgia. Ah, Georgia. Georgia. So we're in a different state, finally. Yay! Um, it is a small part of Savannah, about a fifth of a square mile, by the northwestern corner of the historic district. So according to Gast, this is, quote, um, it is historically a poverty-ridden and violent black neighborhood. In 1859, Savannah had one prostitute for every 39 men, while New York had one for every 57. Yamacraw has been home to many brothels. I'm using the word prostitute because that's what he says, and I'm <laughs> quoting it, but yes. The way that makes it sound like that they're allotted, like you are yeah. assigned this prostitute. <laughs> I know, exactly. I know. His, his phrasing on a few things we'll see is not great. Well, let's look at the chart uh, here. Uh, you are with Sally this evening. <laughs> I know, but also it's just the the fact that they are assigned is just uh, there's something so wrong yeah. about that yeah. as well. It just ugh. anyway, Sally, you have 39 people on your <laughs> roster right now. Get to work. Yeah, I mean, poor Sally, <laughs> poor Sally, indeed. Um, but I will say, Wanda S. Lloyd in the Washington Post article from 1979, the Negro heritage. It says trail, but I think it's meant to say trail. I think it's a typo. Okay. The Negro Heritage, so I'm going to say trail. The Negro Heritage Trail from a Black Perspective says it was, quote, Savannah's oldest and most famous black section where many free blacks lived before emancipation. The first black Baptist church in America was founded in Yamacraw in 1788 by Andrew Bryan. Um, but I just wanted to highlight the difference in the portrayal sure. of the neighborhood, just to give us a little perspective on Two who different is stories. telling the story. Sure. Um, so I seem to have a knack for finding Christmas stories, as this <laughs> one takes place on Christmas Eve of 1900. Oh. Um, it's far less depressing than the last Christmas story I told you. But it's still depressing. Well, just by so, numbers alone. Oh, my God. I know. <laughs> I still think about that. I'm like, <laughs> uh, God bless our audience for, for sticking through that one. Yeah. Um, so what makes this one remarkable is the very young age of the protagonists oh. and how far this song and story reached. It was written in America, made its way across to the Bahamas and then back again, and the song has been recorded by many remarkable artists, including Harry Belafonte, Johnny Cash, who did two versions, Bob Dylan and Pete Seeger. You can find these on the playlist. Um, on the playlist, there are 53 different versions of this song. Wow. So that's how popular this song is. Does it go like this? Aruba, Jamaica. Ooh, I want to take you to Bermuda, Bahama. Come on, pretty mama. That's all we can sing. Yeah. That's but right. is it that? Is it Kokomo? No, but I appreciate the sentiment. <laughs> I just heard Bahamas and went with yeah. it. Yeah, no, I loved it. I loved That's it. That's the only Bahamanian song that I know. Yeah, I don't think I know any other ones, <laughs> <laughs> which is bad. I need to expand my knowledge yeah. of Bahamanian. Caribbean, bah Bahamian, Bahamanian uh, songs. Nailed it. So who are these young protagonists? So I couldn't find much, much info on them before the events of the story, but I'm going to tell them as best I can because there's just not – we have no idea what Delia looks like. Oh. Um, there is not really any information about them before the events of the story. Um, Patrick Blackman likens them to Romeo and Juliet because of their youth and the ardor of their passions. There's also that star-crossed lovers thing. Oh. There are also many comparisons to Frankie and Johnny. Oh which yeah, you are going to. Which I'm. We've already heard the song now. Um, I'm sure you will Episode find episode one. Yes. Yeah. Well, even and and this Delia, we will have played oh, yeah. it for them by now. Um, 
but you can hear in the lyrics. Um, and it's also the portrayal of Delia as a gambler or no good girl. Um, so there's a lot in common there. So there's that fun misogyny and victim blaming we've come to be so familiar with. So Delia Green was born in 1886. She's described as a scrub girl. Now the only definition I could find of this was like, as in scrubs, the song scrubs, like a low down or second rate person. Uh -uh. But her neighbor, Emma West had apparently hired her to scrub. So I'm guessing that the meaning is literally, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Not, no, I don't want to leave no, 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 I don't want to be your time and no. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Um, and also there's, there's a mention of her coming to wash. So I, I think it literally is just scrubbing, which okay. no one in their definitions thought might be a good idea to talk about, but right. Yeah. Um, there, like I said, there are no descriptions of her either. So we're left to use our imaginations. Um, she lived with her mother at Ann street, about 350 feet from where she was shot. She would also die there at the age of 14 at 3 a.m. on Christmas Day. 14. 14. Her killer was Moses Cooney Houston. Houston. It's spelt Houston but pronounced Houston. Right. So he is most commonly referred to as Cooney, spelt C-O-O-N-E-Y, or Cooney, C-O-O-N-I-E. But for our purposes, I'm going to call him Houston. Okay. Love yeah. it. He too was 14. Babies. Yeah. They're babies. They're babies, yeah. Um, although some sources list him as being 16. Mm. He is described at the age of 18 as having yellow skin and of chunky build, round face and small eyes and weighs about 130 pounds. He is five foot four or five inches. So here is the thing, like if he's 130 pounds, he yeah. can't be too chunky. He can't be that chunky. Um, but yeah, but maybe back then, like if you got over a hundred pounds, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> maybe, uh, things were new nutrition was hard to come by back then. Yeah. I, so I yeah, know, but I'm just I'm like standard chunky at 130 pounds is not no. I'm five, say. four. Yeah. So he lived on farm street, 900 feet from the scene of the crime. Our protagonist's youth, although not mentioned in the subsequent songs about them is one of the things, like I said, that made the case so remarkable right. and really captured the hearts of both the public and the jurists involved in the case. Ugh. There are also conflicting reports about the nature of the West house, the numbers of people who were present and the type of gathering it was. So we're going to look at it from a few different angles. Great. So let's look at the story from the prosecution side, as that is the most likely series of events. Okay. So Emma and Willie West resided at 509 Harrison Street. As previously stated, Emma had hired Delia to help her wash dishes and clean up. So scrubbing. scrubbing. Literally scrubbing. According to Willie, Delia was his wife's cousin, although Emma is quoted as saying, I am no kin to Delia Green and she is no cousin to me. So... Hmm. He also testified that he was playing Rock of Ages on the organ at around 11 p.m. Christmas Eve and that others were singing. Cleft for me. Yeah, I was going to say, do you know? I don't know that. Rock yet. of Ages, cleft for me. Oh. Let me hide myself in thee. Yeah. Thank you, Alison. Gorgeous. I was just thinking of Stacey Jackson, um, you know, from the musical Rock of Ages. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Which is, to this day, the funnest show I have ever done. Oh, you would kill in that show. I, I wish I'd seen you in that show. I We did it in Montana. Um, we learned it in a week. I played Regina. Of course she did. Um, who usually doubles as a stripper. But yes. um, I did not have to do that, thankfully. I was happy about that. I was yeah. not mad. In my um, time of playing a stripper, I, I have never been more clothed. <laughs> so I was very happy about that too. <gasps> the funniest, driest, most amazing stripper there ever was. Bunny. Bunny. What a character. But yeah, I would have loved to have seen you in Rock of Ages anyway. It's fun. It's just dumb and fun and very self-aware and knows what it is. And yeah. so if you ever, if any of you ever have the chance to do Rock of Ages out there, I would highly recommend it. Um, so Willie, his sister Rosella, Emma West, and Harriet Gordon all testified that about eight people were present when Delia was shot. Delia was sitting on the bed and Houston was sitting next to her on a trunk. Emma complained to Willie that Houston was cursing. When Willie threatened to put him out, Houston promised to behave and was allowed to stay. The following is a conversation testified to by Rosella, Emma, and Harriet. 
<laughs> so before this conversation, it appears Houston had been bragging that he had been intimate with Delia, which she vehemently denied. Houston, my little wife is mad with me tonight. She does not hear me. She is not saying anything to me. Delia, stop. Cooney, don't put your hands on me. Houston, you don't know how I love you. Delia, you son of a bitch. You have been going with me for four months. You know I am a lady. Mm. Houston, that is a damn lie. You know I had you as many times as I have fingers and toes. You have been calling me husband. Whoa. Delia, you lie. This is where Willie threatens to put Houston out, and Houston says, don't put me out. I know where I am, and I will act better and stop. So Delia said this? Wait. No, Houston said that. Houston said he'll Because Willie better. then says, I'm going to put you out, and Houston okay, says, Thank no, you. no, no, it's fine, I'll stop. So she basically is standing up for her reputation. Right. Um, I just, I had you as many times as I have fingers and toes. <laughs> Uh, and the fact that they're calling each other husband and wife, and they're 14. Yeah. What is happening there? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because I'll tell you, I, I grew up in Northeast Tennessee, and um, I did see one of my my classmates in high school get married uh, in high school. Well, isn't there... Apparently, all you have to do is give your... The parents have to give consent. Well, and... That's in Tennessee, though. But there's still... I I can't... On one of the podcasts I listened to, I think it was someplace underneath where they were talking about the child marriage laws still in place in a number of states where you can marry a... Like a a child can be married to an adult if the parents give consent. Oh, my word. It's... Yeah. It's crazy. Um, yeah, I can't remember the, ex- I should know the statistics a little more on it, but it's, I think it's surprising that there are a number of states where even to this day right now, and a lot of, there's a lot of, um, work to try and change it because for obvious reasons, Jeez Louise. Yeah. Cause they're children and they are minors and they, yeah. 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 If it's your not parents great. have ownership over you and yeah. can sign over. Well, and that's exactly the problem. That's exactly yeah. the issue. So do we know if Delia and Houston were married? Um, they weren't married officially, but there okay. is discussion about um, uh, that. That's how Houston saw her as like his comment. But I think it was just a also um, – the idea was that they'd been going out for a while. Okay. It's to imply that they'd been going out for a while. Yeah. Basically. Um, so Delia then goes upstairs by around 11, 20 PM. Most of the crowd has left and Delia has come back down. She starts to leave saying, let's break up. Houston pulls out a pistol and shoots her in the groin before she can get out the door. She screams, falls back on the bed, says, I am shot and asks to be taken home where she dies four hours later. Oh. Yeah. So the poor thing died in agony, basically. So Willie West runs after Houston, who tries to bribe him. He is unsuccessful and Willie turns him and the pistol over to a policeman. Okay. Houston confesses to this policeman saying he did it because she called him a son of a bitch. Which, from what I understand in my reading back then, was pretty, like, that's pretty inflammatory. But still. But still. No, I am not in yeah. any way suggesting that right. the, that that gave him justification. Right. I'm just saying that from the reading that I did, it was, like, that's a very extreme. Yes. And so he would get inflamed very, very quickly. Um, wow. But also just, like, control your temper. <laughs> And you know, do we do we know if he was drinking or? Well, this is what I'm okay. I'm just about to get to. So, what does the defense say to all this? So, Houston's statement says that he went to Emma West's house. Note that he calls it Emma's house, mm-hmm. not Willie's. So, we're hmm. going to go into what this entails a little bit later. So, he goes there. He says he he went there around seven p.m. Then went home, ate supper, then came back. He called for Delia, but she wasn't there. Willie West asks him to go to the gunsmith and get his pistol, um, which he'd taken there for repairs, gives him the ticket and 50 cents to pay for it. He gets it, then brings it back to the house and puts it under a cloth. Everyone in the house, about 20 or so, according to defense witness Willie wow. Mills, is drunk and they send Houston for, sorry, send Houston for more beer and whiskey. A boy named Eddie Cohen, according to Mills, is there and he and Houston begin struggling over the gun in fun. Like they're just 
playing, tussling, and it goes off and hits Delia. However, Mills is a slightly unreliable witness as he had been jailed for two months for larceny right before the trial. (laughs) So we have conflicting versions, as I said. Now, a James C. Chisholm testifies that he is the gunsmith that Willie West brought a pistol to his shop to be repaired right before Christmas and that he gave it to a young boy. So that tracks. Yeah. Um, according to a defence witness, S. Thomas, and Houston's lawyer, Rayford Falligant, the West House was one of ill repute, to oh, coin an older phrase. There we go. Thomas says, I am familiar with the character of the house in which Willie West and his sister and wife stay. However, he is not allowed to testify further along this line after an objection, which I'm guessing is from the prosecution sure. because – he's not, yeah, he's not allowed to say anything else about it. Um, Falligan says in 1911 that the West home was a rough house. Hmm. And this is quote from Falligan, the lawyer, Houston got into bad company in a rough house and got to drinking. He was crazed by drink in boisterous company for the first time in his life. The crowd he was with got him drunk. It's for this reason that Houston refers to the West House as Emma's house, as brothels were usually run by women. Yeah, madams. Yeah. So. Uh, but I'm sure this is the first time he's ever been oh, drunk. Oh, yeah. First time I'm I've so ever been drunk sure. and it's, it's everyone else's fault because I'm just a poor little boy. I just weirdo. But That's he a, is was a child. Say. He is. But also, like. That doesn't give you the justification to, yeah. and you know, tussling shoot, over a gun. Shoot your girlfriend in the crotch. Yeah. Well, according to him, it was an accident. So. Gun well, laws yeah. have not matured much. <laughs> <laughs> have they? Oh, God. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> no, do not just apologize. It's just the thought. truth. Just cheerful. Um, so what are we left with? On the one hand, we have a defendant with great incentive to throw the blame onto the demon drink and bad company at a house of ill repute. Here we go again. Yeah. On the other, we have that same house say, saying they're these righteous and sober people and that Houston was the only one drinking. They were simply sitting around the organ singing a hymn mm. at 11 p.m. I uh, mean, both of them sound very extreme. Yeah. I want to know... If she's sitting on a bed and there's other people hanging out yeah. in the bedroom, what kind of party is this? Well, I don't think they're in a bedroom. I think there just happened to be a bed in that room. Like she's sitting on a bed because they're downstairs singing around the organ because she goes upstairs. Oh, so this is this whole thing happens with nobody seeing it. No, there, no, there are a lot. No, there's, there's people seeing it because they're, they're all sitting around the organ, and that's how, okay. that's how, because that's how um, Emma and Harriet and Rosella are able to testify to the conversation that happens, right? Because they're sitting, there happens to be a bed in the room where the organ is, which is downstairs. Which <laughs> so I don't know why weird. there is. Um, <laughs> Maybe it's a day bed. Yeah. Um, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But the, the idea is, according to the prosecution witnesses that they're all sitting around this organ singing and that Houston and Delia have a fight yeah and that that then he's but it is but that's how they're able to testify to it yeah I can see both sides where you know she calls him a son of a bitch while they're singing at him (laughs) yeah well also I'm like if this guy's openly going you won't fuck me and she's like "Uh, while they're singing rock of ages cleft for me yeah that's weird yeah, and, and and like openly impugns her reputation in front of everyone. It makes me think that I don't want to think the worst, but it makes me think that the the brothel ideas more. Well, see, this is the thing. I I actually think the opposite. So, okay, and you, you took the words right out of my my mouth, Alison. In my opinion, the truth is somewhere in the middle. Sure, I don't buy it as a brothel. My right. guess is that they were just having a Merry Christmas. Like, they're just having a good time. Just they're having sitting, a party. They're having a party. They're having some drinks, I think, you know. And then sure. he starts having a conversation. Is like, you – I would be furious if someone started having that conversation with me out in public. Yes. And especially at a time when your reputation – and if the house already has this thing hanging over it of this is a, a house of ill repute. Yes. You'd want to stand up for your reputation. Oh. As as when I grew up in a in the Bible Belt, and I yeah. know it's still a thing, your yeah. reputation, and I can only imagine what it was 
back then yeah. to have your virginity questioned. Well, exactly. Um, which is nobody's business. No, exactly. Um, but yeah, so that's what I, that's why I think I don't, I don't think they were all sober as the judge just singing no, a hymn at 11 no, no, PM. No. It doesn't make it <laughs> to me, but I don't, I don't necessarily think the proof is there absolutely for it to be a brothel because the two people that testify to that both have an agenda, sure. you know? Um, so according to Sean Willens, Christmas is a time of special celebration and feasting for the Southern black community since slavery. Um, which makes sense because they would have time off yeah. from having to work. So that is a really important thing on a complete tangent. I just finished reading the fraud by Zadie Smith and they talk about there's a holiday in the, in the, in Jamaica called mm-hmm. John canoe and it's John canoe. And it's, uh, there's, it's like feasting and drinking. It sounds like an absolute blast. Um, yeah. but so this time of year, but then I'm also like, for for what you know, those of us who are not black at Christmas or happen to be of uh, raised in that tradition, mm. is a time of feasting and drinking as well. Sure. Everyone has time off, and yeah. so you know, Gast is pretty convinced the West House was the brothel. He, as we said, he speculates that Thomas would have testified to that if allowed, and that Houston's lawyer Falligan says the same. However, as I said, they're testifying for the defense and therefore have an agenda. Right. Gast's other reason is that the house had two stories and an organ in a large downstairs room. Quote: Typically, downstairs parlors were where customers were received and entertained with conversation, drink, gambling, music, and dancing. For intimacy, customers would go upstairs to a woman's room. And I say so because this house has two stories and an organ, it's therefore a brothel. (laughs) There is no evidence that Delia was a sex worker, despite the frequent portrayals of her as such, such, nor that she was a gambler, as stated in the Willie McTell version of the song, nor is there any evidence that she was seeing anyone else or that she refused Houston's offer of marriage. In fact, we really don't know that much about her at all. Mm. Eddie Cohen, whom Mills identified as the boy tussling with Houston, swears he wasn't there, and Willie West denied there was any struggle in his house, but Mm. Gus says he also denies owning the pistol despite the testimony of the gunsmith. So uh, this is, I mean, there's a lot of contradictions in this. Yeah. Um, so what happened to Houston? The sentence is remarkable because of its leniency owing to his youth. Mm -hmm. In 1901, there was no juvenile system in Georgia. So he was tried as an adult. Mm -hmm. The jury recommended mercy. So the sentence was life in prison. He thanked the judge when the sentence was passed down. Hmm. According to one newspaper, quote, he pranced gaily out. He was as calm and debonair as if the experience through which he had just passed was a matter of everyday occurrence and of no particular importance. (laughs) It was noted that he wore short trousers, which is an article of clothing only worn by young young boys and teenagers. So they're very much trying to play up his, the youth card. He's in short pants. In short pants, exactly. Um, The judge said in sentencing, I perform this duty with some pain and reluctance. I dislike to condemn one of your youth and apparent intelligence to life imprisonment. In so doing, I exhort you to be a man, even in confinement, to repent of your past evil deeds and to strive to earn the confidence and respect of those placed in authority over you. Hmm. Houston's mother, Jane, then apparently broke down and sobbed bitterly. Poor thing. I get it. It's just been... Sentence to life imprisonment. Your 14-year-old. Uh, yeah. On February 9, 1904, he escaped camps of the Chattahoochee Brick Company, mm. which according to Gast was apparently the biggest and most abusive buyer of forced laborers in Georgia. Okay. So super fun. After his escape, he went to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, under the name of George Carl. In 1905, he was imprisoned in the Dauphin County Jail, where he stayed until August of 1908, when he was sent back to Georgia. In 1911, Falligant began working on a clemency appeal. On May 26, Warden J.H. McGuire of Jefferson, Georgia, wrote to Jane Houston, Your son, Mose, is in the very best of health and makes me a model prisoner. So, Mm. you know. Um, With recommendations from several officers and guards, plus a letter from his mother, the appeal was filed on April 25, 1912. On October 9, the Prison Commission of Georgia recommended parole. He served just over 12 years. What? Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. So from life imprisonment, 99 years, as quoted in the song. What? Yeah. He only served over 12 years. That's insane. Yeah. On October 15, 1913, Governor Slayton 
Yes, that Governor Slayton of Parade and the Leo Frank oh. case fame approved his parole. So, yeah. So those two things were also going on at the same time. Oh, my God. Uh, parade is Just, a very heart heart wrenching story and, and one of my favorite confusing favorites. and and just yeah so much yeah it, yeah it's ex- extraordinary story and it's all true um so that was a little bit of music theater um trivia that right. for those fans of the work of jason robert brown maybe we we should we should pick one of the songs make it a murder about <laughs> oh i mean <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maybe we could we d- absolutely could i mean that's one of my favorite scores of all time I'd love to play Lucille mm. one day. Oof. Anyway, three days later, Falligan wrote that a job was available for Houston at the Coloured Laurel Grove Cemetery, which was where Delia is buried in an unmarked grave, most likely in the pauper section near the north end of the cemetery. Mm. In the 1918 Savannah City Directory, he's listed as living with his mother on Farm Street and working at Sav W and C Co. He is believed to have gone to New York at some point in the intervening years, um, was in and out of incarceration, and then died there in 1927 wow. at 41. 41? Yeah. Well, I guess so. Then, that's yeah. Like, yeah. So he, that's he, old man. he lived a whole bunch more life uh, after he killed, getting yeah. off, yeah, with only 12 years. Wow, that's insane. Yeah. So now to the song. According to Patrick Blackman, fragmentary versions emerge as early as 1906 to 1908. Uh, there are two branches of the song. Okay. One in the African-American tradition of the Southeast and another emerging from the Bahamas. Oh, cool. Yeah. So the first is made famous by Blind Willie McTell in 1927, mm-hmm. which is the version that we performed. And the other is by Blind Blake, Blake Alphonse Higgs, and includes the refrain, One More Round, which characterizes the Bahamian version. Huh. Yeah. So um, they think that someone took it across to the Bahamas and then it was brought back to America. Wow. Um, I think when people like Pete Seeger and stuff started recording it much sure. later in the 50s. Um, there are a whole other series of tracks to get to, um, to even to the Willie McTell version, but I just brought up those two because they're kind of the most Mm -hmm. well-known. But, uh, yeah, there are lots and lots of different versions of it appearing. In McTell's version, Houston is renamed Curtis, but I've also seen him referred to as Kenny, Cuddy, and Tony. Wow. Yeah. So I think in – or we'll get to the Johnny Cash version in a little bit. But I think people were trying to get away from the Cooney nickname. Yeah. So – calling him other things. Um, this, oh, yeah. That nickname. Yeah. I, I thought it best to yeah, good. Uh, only say it when I absolutely had to. Absolutely. Yeah. The story is very much told from a mix of his perspective and a third-person narrator. Hmm. In the Blind Blake version, Houston is named Tony and he shoots Delia twice in the side and if he hadn't shot her, she would have cursed him worse. It's also told from purely a third-person perspective. The judge's sentence is more lenient at 64 years than McTell's 99. Hmm. In this, we see a branching of the styles of storytelling too. Gast talks of nodality, which I thought this was really interesting, um, which is where there is a near total suppression of narrative sequence in favor of a series of comments upon a story, which must in large part be inferred from these comments. So we see in the Willie McTell version, it's like um, he'll talk about his own sorrow and his own... Hmm issues and then they'll go into bits of narration so i just like that i thought that was really cool and i there are i have i think we've seen some murder ballads as well where it's like what is the actual story it's hard to get the actual story it's just someone going i feel really crap (laughs) because these things happened um so as I said, McTell's version has some nodal elements combined with more moments of more linear narrative, mm-hmm. while the Blind Blake version is very much a linear narrative. Mm-hmm. In 1952, the song makes its way back to America from the Bahamas, revived by the folk tradition. So Pete Seeger records a version in 1954, then Josh White in 1955, and Harry Belafonte in 1959. Mm-hmm. As I said, there are a whole bunch more covers. I've put them in the, as I said, there's 53 versions of it in wow. the 
playlist. Um, so I'm not going to go through every single one because there's, there's just so many, but most notable among these covers are the Johnny Cash and Bob Dylan versions. Mm -hmm. So as I said, Cash recorded it twice, once in 1962 and later in 1994, his version more closely resembles the Bahamian version with the refrain one more round. However, it's told from Houston's perspective in the first person, right? It talks about him going to Memphis and that the events take place there, which I don't know why that's switched to Memphis. Who knows? Johnny does a lot of artistic license. Well, I think it's also, there's a lot, you know, the blues history in Memphis yeah. maybe and country being Tennessee, oh but. It, well, you know, he, he, he came from Memphis. He lived in Memphis oh, there we for go. a while. And yeah. yeah, that makes sense. So yeah. Um, the 94 version is particularly brutal as wow, he talks about sure tying her to a chair and shooting her, with a, shooting her with a submachine and that her death was her fault because she was mean. And he exhorts <laughs> the listener to do the same if their girl is misbehaving. It's super cool. Wow. And something I read about that Johnny Cash version um, – is that it was uh, it was the mid '90s, so it's that very moody, everything is slightly dark gothy and, thing and nine inch nailsy. <laughs> well, yeah, and I mean, he did record. That's when Hurt. Raj and I love that cover because I can't listen to it. It's so sad. It's very sad because Trent Reznor wrote it at a particularly. Roger's is a big um, Nine Inch Nails fan, right. but it's a beautiful cover, and it. I mean, don't at the watch time, the video because it's just no. so sad. Yeah, it's a lot. <laughs> but it, I, you know, I, I think it brought a level of um, attention to him from a generation that wouldn't necessarily have. Absolutely. Yeah, and it reminds me of um, Black Star and David Bowie, and yes. you know, I think it's kind of in that tradition. Mm -hmm. But she gets her revenge in this version as she haunts him in the jail yeah. as he hears the patter of Delia's feet, which I'm kind of like, That's okay, great. Cool. Also, Delia in the music video is played by Kate Moss. <laughs> <laughs> Just for a little heroin, mid-90s oh, heroin chic. Word. Of course. But I had a look at the video. We might put a little um, link. We might yeah. post a, um, a link to the video in the uh, in the notes because it's it's brutal like he's she's lying in a grave and he's throwing dirt on her and that's wow like, that's a fun day with Judy yeah um Cash is just gonna throw some dirt on you now is that okay um but yeah just interesting so Bob Dylan recorded his version just before Cash's second recording in 1993 on his World Gone Wrong album his more closely resembles the American version Houston is called Curtis and he includes the rather self-pitying line all the friends I ever had are gone <sighs> yeah well, at least in Billy McTell's version, it's like, she's all I got, but she's gone. You know, that's yeah. okay. But Bob Dylan's is like, all oh, the friends I had are gone. Mm -hmm. Also, it's it's weird that the meter is very weird. If, I feel like Bob's like Bob's more of a, a few, poet than yeah, a Yeah. He's luxuriating in a few chords moments where I was yes. like, where is, where is the bar line? Where are you going with this? Yeah, that's my musical brain, though, that needs to do that. It also has a very curious and rather problematic line in it called Men in Atlanta Trying to Pass for White. What? Yeah. What? So, yeah, it's it's one of the verses. I was like, hmm. So, yeah, both versions are not super cool. Not that cool. No. Yeah. Um, Feminist manifestos <laughs> is what you're trying to say. <laughs> well, not just feminist, but also racist. <laughs> just... Just, just yeah. anti, yeah. Just the best. Of also, why do you care about people? Uh, are they like trying to pass for white? Like, what? Who cares? How does that have any relevance to this song? And, and why does it affect you? Yeah, Bob Dylan. Oh God. <laughs> anyway, anyway, um, so, we really don't like Bob Dylan. <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> so Delia Green deserves so much more than what she got. For the simple crime of resisting someone's advances and standing up for herself, she is shot, dies in agony, and her reputation is forever oh. besmirched in songs sung and written by men in at least two countries. Yeah. Although I did find in the Spotify list there are a couple of versions by women. Oh, good. Yeah, So, um, but m the majority of them are men. There is, there is a a coda to this I've been dying Ooh. I almost revealed to you when we were practicing earlier but um Ooh, I'm, excited. I'm very yeah 
Um, but she has the last laugh. While we have no idea where Houston is buried, there is a wonderful coda to this story. So according to Will Peebles of the Savannah Morning News, in 2020, Steve Salter of the organization Killer Blues, a non-profit which places headstones for blues musicians buried in unmarked graves, Mm -hmm. heard about Delia's story and decided to designate her the first blues muse and give her the acknowledgement she deserves. Quote, with all the people that have recorded songs and made money off of her name, not one saw fit to place a marker on her grave. No one saw fit to see to it that this poor, innocent woman who was a child was murdered and taken advantage of, and she's still being taken advantage of 120 years later when people are singing those songs about her you know it's time for a new song it's time for a song of redemption that killer took her life and reputation and this killer wants to redeem that reputation wow well steve yeah have i got a story for you well 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 i have written that song yes she has um, and i found the killer blues uh, website and i am going to email him a copy of this episode oh that's exciting and say I wrote that song, sir. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. Delia, oh Delia, what did it do to you? What is the reason that that he shot you? That is the end of the story of Delia Green. I just think we need to stop making Romeo and Juliet the epitome of romance. I know. They were children. They were children. And it was also deeply resulted in both of their deaths. Yeah. That is not love. No. (laughs) That might be obsession. Yeah. Uh, Definitely a little bit of lust, but that was not love. No. 
No, that was deeply problematic. We need to stop. Let's just stop doing Romeo and Juliet. Yeah. And if so, we're just going to blame Friar Lawrence for everything. <laughs> and it's yeah. the thing of I, she, you owe me. You owe me just because I, I say that I've had sex with you a lot of times before. And the, uh, it's just. I really wanted to read it. The, the dialogue, the, the fact he's so pouty. And he's like, mm-hmm. she mad. He doesn't. She's not saying anything to me. Like the, I wanted, like I can totally see him kind of pouting. He um, had to have been drunk. Like, but then you think about the emotions of a 14 year old. Yeah. Or even 16 year old boy. Yeah. And this is why teenagers are terrifying. <laughs> oh yeah. But <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I do have, I do have some nieces uh, that that are teenagers yeah. and that might potentially listen to this, uh, and I would like to say, um, I love you. I think you're very smart, but you're not emotionally mature yet. So <laughs> don't make any rash decisions, because um, I guarantee in five years, none of that shit's gonna matter anymore. Yeah. No, there was something in I can't. I, I didn't include it because I thought it was a bit dumb. But Gast makes some wide sweeping statement about teenage boys and their inability to control themselves, and you know, it was something along those lines. Yeah. And I'm like, see, that's what we. It's I don't not know. just boys, though. And no. It's, and, but we need to stop this. Boys will be boys. But this is why the importance of teaching consent and this generation has an Absolutely. advantage now is that they're learning this language. They're learning a lot more how to have these conversations, which, you know, has been needed for a really long time. And I think that it's so so important to a to talk about the emotions and the feelings and the things that you're going through, mm-hmm. and b. Um, to to have these conversations around around consent and body autonomy and um absolutely you know cuz this this is what can happen but also you know be, be okay enough not to get so defensive when someone stands up for themselves absolutely. it's like when you get cat called in the street and you I turn around and arc up and they get Whoa, you, you, you know they'll insult you right after and you're like yeah. but you just gave me a compliment so which is it sir yeah I just love being told to smile. That is, uh, that's that's guaranteed to oh. to set my teeth on edge and get my hackles yeah. up. Yeah. So anyway, we forgot to say earlier on as well that was um, the the Willie McTell version had what was that instrument that you're playing in it? A jaw harp. Yeah, it we had go. other horrible an, another horrible name, but we call it a jaw harp now. Yes. Um, yes. <laughs> um, and then, yes, we, me on guitar and, um, Alison playing the, uh, playing the kazoo. Does one play the kazoo? I, I think so. I think one plays the kazoo. Yeah, sure. Or does the kazoo <laughs> play you? <laughs> <laughs> so what did we learn this episode? Teenage kids are terrifying. <laughs> Teenage is terrifying. Way I mean, too many emotions. They feel so intensely. Yeah, it's hor- so, just so hormones. Many hormones are crazy. And I can testify to that. Being a new mom, hormones are insane. Crazy. Yeah. Um, also, just don't be so defensive. How fragile do you have? To, how fragile does your masculinity have to be? And well, that's it. I mean, and we've talked about experiences in the past. Like I've had experiences where I called, and I will say a man, uh, I called a man on their shit. And yeah. the reaction is never, I'm so sorry that I made you feel that way. Yeah. It's always, well, it's defensive. Mm-hmm. And it's like, well, you know, you did something wrong. If you're acting that defensively, if someone calls you on your shit. I just hope that we can raise a better generation of men. Yeah. And... Or, or just people. people. I think we are. I, I have a lot of faith in this new generation. I mm-hmm. see the conversations, the ease with which they are navigating um, the, the switch from the thoughts around gender as, as a binary to yes. a spectrum. They navigate it. Like I watch my niece navigate that with such ease. Right. You know, because it has, 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 it has always been a spectrum. We are just now starting to speak about it that way. But, yes. you know, I think the fact that we are having conversations around consent, I think the great. fact that we're having, I know for me as a mom, I'm already like, uh, my daughter will see me be sad and she will see me, you know, navigate that and emotions are good. And we're having 
open conversations around that. And I think that's, you know, it gives me yeah. faith. But and this, this, these past generations didn't have a chance. There was no language for it yet. No. There's also something to be said about the preciousness of, I'm not victim blaming here, but just if we didn't hold in such high esteem the invisible yeah. imaginary thing that's virginity. Yeah. And the pure and this pure virginal, you know. Yeah. Whereas people standard. are getting, people are doing stuff. They're doing other stuff. They're doing everything but. And I, and I, and she has every right to be upset about that and back in the day, but we, we just hold that into yeah. this imaginary thing of virginity. And but I don't, esteem. I don't put that on her. I put that on the society and yes. the conditioning around her that Absolutely. told her that that's how precious that and was. And it would ruin your life. Yeah. If that rumor got around, it yeah. would totally ruin your life. Yeah. So, so yeah. Ugh, it's just a mess. Yeah. You guys, please watch your teenagers and listen to them and make sure they're making mature emotional decisions or, or, or they're giving their emotions time to process yeah. <laughs> before they react on yep. them. Yep. No, I think that's it. It's feel it, let it out, but don't act on it. Yeah. <laughs> Try not to. But then again, we've all done dumb shit. <laughs> Just wait a minute. Yeah. <laughs> wait, a, wait, give it a day. Yeah. Before you react. Yeah. Just give it a day. Yeah. That's what I want to tell myself every time I like, yeah. have an emotional response to something. I can have an emotional response, but before you answer that person, give it a day. Yeah. <laughs> or write it down and then put it in the freezer or burn it. Yeah. Something. That's, yeah. Yeah. Although don't, don't, as I once did to a guy that was annoying me that I had been dating, <laughs> type out a text message with no intent of, send, intent of sending it and then accidentally sending it. No. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, that's awful. Yeah. Oh, no. But to be honest, it was all things that I would like. Once I did it, I was like, oh, the well, stuff, it's done the, now. The stuff that I've done emotion, as an emotional <laughs> response as a teenager, was I didn't shoot anybody, but I'm telling you, just the palm to the... <laughs> The palm to the forehead of oh, yeah. and the groans that come out. I'm just so embarrassed. When I think about the way I reacted to, to certain things, I'm just like, oh, my God. Mm. Super fun. But anyway, um, thank you so much for joining us. Thank we you, hope you enjoyed you. this episode. Um, uh, thank you, my friend. Thank for you, Amelia. You did an amazing <gasps> job. Thank and, you, and I'm always impressed by her research and Aww. and how intelligent she sounds she sounds as putting together this the thing she's such a great writer and oh and friend the feelings mutual oh my word no yeah i'm just a goofball <laughs> um, um yeah please find us on the socials follow us we, should we include kokomo on the yeah on i the... absolutely think we should <laughs> <laughs> on our playlist yep also my uh, my daughter apparently loves uh she did love the little beach boys roger was playing her monkeys and beach boys and then i started playing her queen and she loves queen she has taste yeah um but yes follow us on the show- socials at cormac and gwyn on instagram and then um we find our youtube channel as well which is where all these episodes if you don't subscribe on any of the podcast platforms you can find it on youtube yeah um, what else? Oh, our email, cormacandgwyn at gmail.com. Let us know about what songs you would like to cover, have covered. Yeah. Um, and we're, we're getting all the ones that we can sing completely without, yes. co- without copyright starting, so stopping us. Public we're domain. Getting, we're getting the public domain ones out, out of the way first so we can give you full songs. Yeah. And then as we branch out, we'll, we'll. We'll yeah see what we can do because there's some really fun modern ones as well yes um yes. that stories we'd love to cover um but yeah rate review and subscribe please 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 and let us know if you're listening i know a few of you have reached out on um on the social media yeah. which tell we your friends. really love yeah tell your friends and um yeah don't go down by the river please don't yep. just or if you do have your life preserver on yep and your mm, life alert button (laughs) and don't find yourself in some dark holler